Good afternoon. I'm Guillaume Rien, Director of System Engineer for Maroon Networks in Canada. I've been with the company roughly five and a half years, uh, going to six years, which is it's a long time in, in IT. Uh, what I'm hoping to do today is, I, I've been reading some of your blogs, and uh, <laughs> Uh, a lot of you are expecting me to talk about single channel architecture, I'm sure. Uh, we'll probably dive into that. But there, there's a lot of stuff that I'll ask you to be open-minded about and that Maru is not necessarily just a single channel architecture company. And you'll be uh, maybe surprised to, to see some of the, the stuff we do. I'd like to start with a quote from Craig Matthews that he uh, recently gave uh, in one of our events with uh, Robert Christ. And Basically, wireless LAN system architecture is the key element in long-term success. Obviously, 10 years ago, the Wi-Fi was an overlay. It's changing rapidly now. It's becoming, in a lot of places, the primary network. As it's becoming the primary network, we need more flexibility on how to architect our system. And that's really what the topic should be about today is what kind of architecture can we do to make each and every application and each and every customer uh, happy and, and have a network that will be reliable? So with that in mind, we have an architecture called Mobile Flex. Mobile Flex is all about flexibility for the mobile environment, being the wireless. So if we start from the top down, uh, obviously there, there's so many software and features and product that we have. We're not going to touch on that today. But I want to present the architecture that from the top right down to the access point, we have solution at every layer. Starting with our technology partner, um, you guys are using in different verticals a lot of partners. These partners might be, you know, the Microsoft Link or in the health care. Um, it, it could be some biomed equipment. Regardless of what they are, we need to ensure that they work properly on our system. So we like to uh, participate with them in some interrupt testing. And then at the policy level comes the user and the device. It is becoming more and more important these days to be able to have policy right down to the user or maybe to the device that these users are having. So based on device, application, location, or time, we can take and enforce some policies. Now it is also uh, part of a presentation that you'll have, Identity Manager today, which describe uh, that unique solution. One layer down, uh, need to have management. If you're going to run a wireless network, it's one thing to set it up, but two, you need to be able to manage it efficiently. And uh, on the management side, we have EZRF, our application suite that allow for management, troubleshooting, and security. At the control layer, everybody understand here, and I've seen an interesting blog the other day, I don't remember by who, on um, data plane. Uh, control plane and management plane. I think it was maybe Mr. Badman, is it possible? That was discussing <laughs> the, uh, uh, how you know, the control plane basically is one thing, but the data plane could be either centralized or distributed. Well, we support both architecture. Uh, our controller could be uh, centralized and have the data plane of the user coming back to a centralized environment or distribute across all the AP for local traffic switching. And we have also an offering in a VMware a, a type of appliance so you can deploy easily in the cloud or some hosted managed services. And then at the access layer, this is where obviously we have the access point. And this is where you guys have the most interest, not necessarily in the access point itself, but definitely in the flexibility on how we can deploy those access points. And obviously, a lot of the industry, you guys are familiar with the multi-channel architecture that we absolutely support, but also we do some unique stuff with single channel and channel layering and also channel segregation. So all about flexibility. So what is that flexibility that we offer? Well, the traditional way, we're all very familiar with uh, the three-channel approach where we have three-channel non-overlap, etc., cetera, uh, which in my opinion, it is, you know, in some application, uh, a little bit of waste of megahertz because it is so limited that we, we should be very careful with it. But the other issue with um, traditional um, way of deploying is the fact that the client is so much in control. Uh, we all recognize that the client makes a decision on which access point they're going to connect to and et cetera. So, so there is use case and we'll see how Maru actually used that architecture. But in our flexible uh, architecture, we can deploy in multi-channel, but we also introduced 10 years ago, or at the, at the beginning basically, single channel architecture. Now the single channel architecture does not come along, it, it comes as well with virtualization. And virtualization allow us to put the 
control back into the network and make some handoff uh, decision, roaming decision, and make sure that the client is always optima optimally served by an access point. Once you have single channel architecture, you can start doing neat stuff like channel layering to increase either density or capacity. And finally, air traffic control has multiple components, but one of them being airtime fairness. I think you will all recognize that airtime fairness was uh, created uh, mostly by Maroud uh, day one, and that people are starting to realize in the last few years that it is necessary to have airtime fairness in your network. All good? Question at this time? <coughs> so let's just go back in time and, and make a case of why single channel and virtualization made so much sense. So if we take that network being deployed and the client there that wants to connect will we'll send, as you know, probe requests. All the APs that can hear him will send probe response and, and that's all good. But the metrics that the client was basing his decision to connect to an AP was strictly single strain, right? The, the, the strain of the response coming back from AP. So there's a pretty good chance that this client would actually connect to the nearest AP, while maybe another AP not too far away would have a better ratio of user on it. This one could be easily at 50, 60 user, and this one only has one or two. So that, that's one of the misbehavior. But the biggest one that single channel wanted to address uh, eight, nine, 10 years ago was when you roam, you actually need to do a handoff. And, and some of you has written some stuff about, well, when, when the standard was defined, they didn't really have in mind that roaming would happen, right? They, they, they believed that an access point would be sufficient for the most use, and, and roaming was not very, very well defined. So today, in order to roam, you need to get off channel, send probe requests, get those responses, the associate and reassociate. There's newer protocols that are coming that might help to fix that. But again, the issue, the client has to support those new standards. Um, even worse, there's some uh, client that will be sticky. So you could easily have that client sitting at the end of the hallway and still associated to that first AP, and that again is creating an issue. So in the single channel architecture virtualized environment, what we've done is that we've removed all those decisions from the client. The probe request being sent out is actually responded by the best AP. And this is the network that decide, the controller in the virtualized environment will decide which radio should reply to that client. Two, as the clients start roaming through that facility or walking through that facility, the association is moved from one radio to another. Totally transparently, the client does not see that. There's no channel change, there's no deassociation. Actually, you could be running or in a golf cart. I have some customers that are driving in the yard with a golf cart. And, and that roaming or seamless handoff is happening always predictively for all the client, always uh, under the same criteria. And that takes less than one to three milliseconds. So normally, just a ping hiccup might happen, but you would probably not even notice that you've been handed off from one AP to another. So very unique architecture that was originally to solve client issue and put the network back in control. Question at this point? All good. So what are uh, some of the use case that also allow us to, to do unique things with the single channel? Well, the distribution is, is very often an issue. Right? If I have 99 people walking into this place and, and that would be the main entrance, well, there's a good chance that 60 people gets connected to that AP. And even if they're sitting in the back or, or further down, they still are associated to, to that AP. We do those tests on a regular basis. Now, a 20 might be there, a 19 might be there. Now, you do have three channel on that floor, but because you don't control association on which layer you're going to put them, there's a situation where, well, those people has definitely a better experience than these people, and, and no one is using really your third channel, or you cannot really enforce that easily. Well, if you have a density and, and a low balancing issue, well, it can easily be done by layering channel. Multiple single channel can be layered to add either density or capacity. So density, the amount of users that you'll connect, capacity just from a pure RF perspective. At any single square footage that you have, you have those three layers available, right? If I have 50 nurses in a hospital at the end of a shift all talking around here with a multiple device, well, I still have only one layer for them word of capacity. Where here, regardless of where they're roaming in a channel layered environment, if the requirement is there, I do have those three channels available all the time, regardless of where they're going. But that's one of the interesting use case. 
Uh, segregation of traffic. More and more as network are becoming the primary network, there's a need for quality of service. SLAs become more and more important. So how do we offer different quality of service to different community, service, or application? Well, the traditional way is definitely to create three SSID. So I can have a critical SSID, an enterprise one, and one for my visitors. Now, in the air, I have a different security profile. They might map to a different VLAN. I might apply different quas rule to them. But what is the issue? Well, I have a bottleneck. These three SSIDs are tied to a single radio, a single RF channel. So what will happen if I get the RF saturated by an influx of devices that are, are just there on the network trying to connect, like 50 visitors suddenly all trying to be on your network? Sure, you can do quality of service, you can prioritize, but as we all know, it works downstream, not very well upstream, because there's not much you can do to control the client. So again, single channel offer an alternative. We can easily say, we're going to install one AP that has three radio, right? Maru has uh, some offering of a single radio, two radio, three radio, and we even had in the past some four radio. So a single AP installation can offer segregation right down to the application. So you can now reserve bandwidth for your critical application. And we can easily see how in healthcare, if I'm the manager of a hospital and I have now patient life at risk whenever I'm uh, running you know, monitoring device, it would be interesting to be able to run them on a specific RF layer and then protect that layer that no other device can be on that channel. Now it also allow me to protect that channel and enforce my policy by having a spectrum manager, for example, in this network that would look at the spectrum and still allow other user to have wireless device on different channel. So in effect you're advocating fixing an application to a particular channel. Uh, do you see a lot of people doing that like in healthcare? In practice? I, I would say that in healthcare, uh, I personally have uh, in my territory over 12 hospitals that are doing exactly that because they cannot run the chance that biomed equipment does not work. And typically in a hospital, biomed is a different department than IT, and, and they normally want to control their own channel. And if I'm an IT administrator, I know exactly how many biomed devices I have. I know what client type they are. I know what throughput they're going to use. So I can absolutely engineer my network with the right amount of RF bandwidth and capacity. From a spurious interference perspective, though, you're going to get, you know, if you fix all of your EMR application to channel one <coughs> site-wide, if you have spurious interference that come and go on channel one, or, or would it go through 1, 6, and 11? You don't have that flexibility of being able to move away from that, right? Well, I'm, I'm going to show you an interesting, in a couple slides, uh, just two slides from now, you'll oh, see sure. uh, an alternative that absolutely I can protect myself even for that. So th there's always that automatic radio that you can do and try to mitigate, but then you're disrupting quite a bit of your other user. So is it always a good payoff to change channel or mitigate around that if you're going to hit 90% of your network, right? right? Yeah. So, the, and not every customer needs to do that, right? So again, it's the flexibility of being able to install an architecture. You can start with a single channel for all and have SSIDs just like that, three SSID on, on a single RF radio, just like you're doing traditionally. But you have the flexibility of, as an IT man, to say, well, no, I'm going to reserve bandwidth. Best effort, they can fight on all the other two channels. But my medical grade or anything that is mission critical to me needs to be on a specific channel. Yes? You alluded to that Biomed kind of controlled wireless. Is that what you were, you were driving to? Like Biomed actually controlled some level of the wireless network? Well, at least, they control, at least they control what goes into the biomed network, right? So they, they can def define which device, what service type they're using, and then they control how much bandwidth is being required for each of these devices so they can engineer the network properly. Another interesting concept comes with redundancy. Uh, you're asking the question on, okay, how, how do you provide... Uh, redundancy from an RF perspective. Well, the traditional approach works very well, and Maru certainly supports that, uh, and that's what we have in most of our customer, where you have your AP going to switches, to a data center, and then you might have one or two wireless LAN controller that are in an N plus one kind of cluster. While we do support that approach, it, it is interesting to look at well, how we can improve the redundancy by saying, okay, let's have a set of radio that are going to one wiring infrastructure to data center, 
to my first wireless line controller one and two, but let's have a, another SSID, exactly the same, my mission critical SSID on a different set of radio, on a different wiring infrastructure and, and switches, obviously, and going to a different wireless line controller. Then at that point, what I really have is redundancy at every layer. If I lose a switch and some access point, I still have redundancy on a different layer. If I have RF interference, as you just mentioned, then I have also redundancy. And I can lose a full data center and I have redundancy. So what's the difference between doing that on two separate channels for the APs and having just individual multi-channel APs? I mean, to me, it seems like the client would still be deciding which one they wanted to, to join up with. Um, so here, the, the challenge is if I want to have redundancy because of a switch failure, right? If the switch is controlling those four APs, how do I have active APs that are always there in parallel all the time, right? I don't have additional channels or radio sending that signal. Here, what I'm saying is, imagine a hospital, and you have a single channel throughout all your hospital, but in intensive care unit, where really one or two AP would address the RF coverage requirement, you might just have one or two AP that goes to a small virtual controller of five AP license, and then you have built your redundancy right down to even the RF layer, the, the switches. I wasn't particularly referring to the redundancy. I mean, there, there's other architectures like the uh, architecture that uh, Aerohive has, for example, that Absolutely. don't rely on controllers and Absolutely. could totally do the same thing. But I'm referring more to the, the client would see that as being like two separate APs. Absolutely. And they would see two different BSSID. You're right. They would right. be just choosing whichever to connect to. They, so they, you're, they could. you're ceding control back to the client again. They, they could, but you could influence them by having you know, a preferred channel if you have those options in the client, etc. So th this is a concept of an architecture that you could improve redundancy. How many client, you know, there's hitless configuration. This is absolutely not hitless. The client would have to decide to roam from one channel to another at that point. You're absolutely right. And then the single channel architecture allow us for also some very uh, cool troubleshooting. If I'm installing, let's say, a school division and I have 150 school, and when I install this, I might want to baseline my network. I might want to know what is the performance I can expect from my wireless system. And so there's a couple of ways of doing this. I'm sure some of you has walked a site before and, and measured throughput. Uh, well, it's convenient to be able to just, with our network uh, service assurance manager, to deploy virtual client into APs or radio that will in turn associate to another AP in the neighborhood. Because we're running single channel, uh, an AP be, can become a servicing client and also act as a client to another AP. So in this case, that means that now, if I'm starting uh, doing that connection and I'm starting to put traffic through, I can measure what is the actual throughput at every single location and baseline the throughput, the latency, and the packet loss that I have on day one when I'm confident that my installation is good. So each AP has multiple radios in a given frequency, or is it one radio that you can slice between frequencies, or are you overlaying multiple APs? Well, if this is a single channel, let's pretend those four APs are on channel one, sure. and, and the second radio on channel 36, the radio will actually be servicing client on channel one, but also act as a client and connect to an adjacent AP. At and the same time. On the same channel, at the same time, yeah. It just slices the... It's just the time slicing you mean. Absolutely. So, what you really can do after that is, well, in six months from now, let's pretend that now you do a test once a week or once a day, you know, regardless of how many times you do it, but you suddenly have 10 megabit instead of 20, and you have 100 milliseconds latency instead of two. Well, there's really, is there something wrong with the network? How would you, as an IT admin that is sitting 50 miles from that school, know that suddenly, that day, the throughput went down, right? Maybe user would call in and say, it's a little bit slower today, and you would say, well, maybe there's more people on the network today. There's no really metrics to measure on. While if you baseline, day one, the same day that something has just happened, you will be able to know and call at that site and say, hey guys, there's definitely something going on there. Is there an AP? that has been damaged, or maybe an AP that was taking offline, et cetera. So th there's a lot of stuff you can find with that. So there's, a, there's an issue with that scenario as well, in that the APs all being in the ceiling, 
are really not giving you exactly the same connectivity that a client, say, in the corner absolutely. of the building would be seeing. You're absolutely right. And the idea is not to, to measure the actual throughput of what a client could see, but to have a baseline so I know in six months if my network has changed because somebody put a new wall or a closet or something, that my, now my throughput is not what I had planned originally when I did my installation. Right? If I was planning for an AP here in this room and suddenly they built a wall here, then I don't have good coverage anymore and I was not aware. So now that will tell me day one something has changed in my environment. So it's the difference. Wouldn't it be a more accurate measurement to have a client actually go out there and walk through the hallway and do a baseline with, a, with an actual client than trying to use the APs like that? Absolutely, but then how do you test that every day to see if your network has degraded, right? And apparently are, the company are, are, that we talked to this morning has that. <laughs> <laughs> they, they're gonna walk every day? No, they, they have a, a unit that does that kind of testing on a consistent basis. I, I'm not aware of how to do it, but yeah. that's one easy way, right? So the network can self-heal and give but, you... But I think for most of us as, as engineers, I mean, part of our... Um, what we do is, is in deploying things and, and also in future testing when there is issues with the network as we go out and we do a baseline of the network check to make sure everything's working properly, that the APs are giving sufficient signal throughout the environment, that, that clients can actually make connections from different places places in the environment. That's a standard part of our methodology. I'm not sure that using APs to test the, the throughput from one AP it, to it another would give you an accurate view of what you're the absolutely network right. So like. it doesn't remove the exit survey or whatever your yep. work you're doing for your client that will give you a better picture of what you have. It's really just a tool to say, hey, something has changed in a year from now and I need to investigate. That's it. At the sure. same time on the um the virtual client, you can also do things like test authentication servers and all of that, right? Exactly. That's the second use case. Thanks for the segue. Um, <laughs> so I, I can do remote troubleshooting, right? I'm sitting right here 50 miles from that school. A teacher calls me in panic saying, hey, nobody can connect. And of course, they're blaming the wireless network, regardless of if it's the wireless network or not. Uh, so you say, no problem. Let me drive there. I'll be there in an hour. I'll test it for myself. No. You spawn a virtual client. You send it over there, and immediately, while doing the same kind of connection, you can now detect if you do have an RF issue, or maybe you have some other failure on the network, whether it's a VLAN misconfigured, a controller, or maybe simply a DHCP scope that is not giving IP address. So right now, within five, 10 seconds, I would know that, hey, client do connect, so it's not the RF but I'm not getting an IP address. So immediately you don't have to search, you know that the HTTP is down and you fix it, right? Yeah. Or it could be the radius server not answering to your request and you'll know that. And service assurance manager is a separate box or it's a function of? It's a function of our management platform. Of the, manager, of the NMS. The okay. NMS, correct. All right. when, when it's testing, say something like authentication, can I, in this virtual client that I'm controlling, can I push down things like um, CA trust and things like that into it? Or is it just not caring about the certificate? And, so I don't and believe we'll be that to today, I can that. defer that to PM, but I don't believe that today we, we push certificate or anything like that. So there, there would be some maybe authentication scheme that you could not test, but you could easily imagine, imagine some other use case, like maybe test the load uh, that you have on a given network in a given day, right? If I want to know, can I put one more additional application on my network? So at three o'clock, it's your peak time, you're running a client and you test the throughput available on top of your existing capacity at that day. Mm -hmm. So you know your headroom, right? Can you just do one client or can you do multiple clients? So could I so you, you do can, this as a So you can move clients well? anywhere you want. Well, you, but you cannot start multiple clients simultaneously okay. today, uh, at least. Okay. Um, so, putting it all together, if we go at some example, uh, and I'm really surprised we went through single channel architecture and there's not too many uh, questions at this point. Uh, let's look what we can do. Are you willing to take a question? We will take question. We get it out of the way, the whole uh, co-channel <laughs> interference thing? <laughs> yeah. Well, okay, uh, that, that could be a topic in itself. Um, so the idea is that with single channel, as I, I showed you, and we're gonna see more example, the idea is not to see if single channel can actually outperform or perform better. It, it's actually use case, right? If I'm in healthcare, for example, that hospital uh, example I gave, well, there's no other way that I can guarantee that my medical device will not have uh, their, their RF channel. So I can guarantee 
service, I can guarantee bandwidth, I can guarantee how many devices I can put on that network without worrying uh, uh, you know, about interference of other network. So, Code Channel, it, how, how much can you do reuse? Can you do reuse uh, at 10%, 50%, 60%? Um, you know, there, there's all kinds of number that could be bounced depending on scenario and environment. Just like in multi-channel architecture, we do channel reuse, right? We, if you have enough separation and distance, you will do some channel reuse. In the single channel architecture, obviously we take that more into consideration. But there's obviously still a, a physics limitation on the interference because Absolutely. all of the APs are occupying the same piece of ESO. So you, you don't really have the same capacity availability that a multi-channel architecture would have. Well, because the use case is not capacity, right? And if you go back 10 years ago, you're absolutely right. Capacity was not the main driver. Today, video streaming demands it's, a it's lot more capacity, so much. you need more RF channel, obviously. And we're going to see a good example of mixing in exactly the same network and, and exactly the same Maru, three different kind of architecture on the same exact network. So let, let's go through that. So the key consideration, uh, obviously, is RF. Everybody needs to know how to deploy from an RF perspective, NEG60 to NEG65, whatever your criteria will be for your customer and device type. Uh, but then you have to look at metrics of density as well. How many, if I could build a one AP that would transmit and connect a thousand people and have just that one AP in the middle of the building, that would be ideal. But those radio cannot support 500 connections, so we need to consider adding more radio for the density issue. And then we have a bandwidth requirement. How can I fix bandwidth requirement? Well, the only way is to throw more megahertz at it. And four, people, a lot of people tend to forget about the client type and how much influence the client will have on your overall network. So, Four easy steps that I, we're just going to go through and, and look at application. One, have a client count. Some of my universities, for example, uh, in uh, Toronto, they're using uh, a, a factor of 2.5. So if they're going to have a room that can sit 100 people, they'll multiply it by 2.5, and that's the, the number that they use to design the capacity for that room. So client count is critical. Two, find out what kind of client. Now, you don't have to go down to every single client, but have an average, right? What we see in large university or campus these days is about 60% of two streams client and capable. So that gives you a rough idea of your community and how much bandwidth you're going to have. Three, find out the application that you'll run. And four, calculate the number of channel required to do channel layering. So a simple question that was just a, a little quiz here. If I have a classroom of 30 students, and each viewing HD quality video at their own pace simultaneously, can I run this on a single AP? Maybe, maybe not, right? If high so, quality video is this big at 720p, maybe? Yeah, well, let, let, let's pretend that in this case, it's it could be a buffer. 30 times 5 megabits per second. So let's imagine that at one time, I have 150 megabits per second up in the air. Well, the answer is, well, maybe it will work on one AP. Obviously, I have enough association on one AP, but it's going to depend on the client type. If those clients are single stream and at 20 megahertz, the maximum I'll get out of it is 20 to 28 megabits per second. So don't replace the AP. Don't throw more AP. Just change the client in this scenario, and now the same AP, the same network can suddenly support your application, right? So client has a huge impact on your network, and a lot of people tend to forget that, especially I see that in school division. They have an iPad project, they buy 500 iPads, and they believe that, hey, they can do all the application of video streaming and everything without calculating anything else but the association count. And then they ask, how many clients can I connect? I, I just try 60 students all at the same time. They all connect, but the application crash, right? Well, yeah, you need to calculate your bandwidth and make sure you have the proper client to supply that bandwidth. Now, in many cases, you don't control the client. So if you don't, then what can you do? Well, you need to add more capacity. So let's take a high-density example together. Let's pretend this is a hotel or whatever verticals you prefer to work in, and you do have a high-density room that you need to work with. And in that room, you might have 255 clients. And I've offered here a little breakdown of you know, 65 iPads doing dif different things, 110 laptops that are dual streams capable, and then another 45 triple stream and video at, at 45 and 35 uh, client count. So from a client count, I can easily do that with only two or three radio, right? If I install an AP433, I have three radio in that AP, 
I could potentially connect those 255 users. But if I look at the type of client that I have in my mix, and you can go down just to percentage, I have 65 single stream client, and I have 155 dual stream and 35 triple streams. That gives me a very good idea of how much megabits per second I can get out of a single channel. Roughly, when you have majority of dual stream client, you can roughly estimate that mix to be around 50 megabits for the exercise that's what we'll use, right? And three, look at the application and the associated throughput for what your user community will do. And then finally, just calculate the amount of channel you would need to do that. So if I add all the bandwidth required by my user and application, it comes up to 443 megabits per second that I would need of available airtime. So how do I calculate now how many channel? Well, it depends on the client type. So if I take that 443 divided by roughly 50 megabits per second for one channel, because I estimated that 20 megahertz with mostly dual stream client will give me an average of 50 megabits per second of throughput. That gives me nine channels, essentially, that I would need to stack. So how do we do that? Well, easily. Let's Back just the previous slide. Sure. You missed a big number on step five. What's your oversubscription rate? Because not, not all 150 clients are all doing the web simultaneously. You're absolutely right. So that's why this is a guideline. This is an example. If, if whatever your number is, and if you have an oversubscription, you're absolutely right. You should consider that. Uh, absolutely. So this is not you know, a foolproof scientific. It's a guideline of how you can. And it, the exercise was to show that bandwidth is, is a huge consideration to show the, the case for maybe channel layering, or how do you fix that? So you first start by adding all your APs uh, throughout your floor. And those AP could be just dual radio AP. You have one channel in the 2.4 and one channel in the 36, and they're using single channel architecture all the way up. In your identity in area, well, I might need to throw a little bit more. So I'm going to use the AP433. It has three radio per AP. So that means I just created two pods, which again is an easier deployment, right? Instead of putting APs all throughout every 25 feet under the table or whatever, I can now create pods, which from a client perspective, it's easier to deploy. Two, from a, the client view, all the signal strength is the same from all the AP, which allow me to do unique stuff like dynamic load balancing without having the client to, to worry about. So now I have nine channels that are stacked in that environment. So I could do segregation if I wanted of traffic for the video uh, client, or I can just do dynamic load balancing and some band steering for the 2.4 to 5 gig capable client. So now I do have a lot more association possible, potentially up to 1,000 association. But my requirement for additional channel was the bandwidth requirement of 450 megabits per second. What happens in that spot right below your, uh, your bottom cluster of three APs? where you're re-overlapping channel one on top of your existing channel one service by your bottom three APs. Right, so, so that single channel could be the same single channel. So you have that effect of channel reuse, right? What percentage you will get depend on, on wall, environment, and et cetera. Uh, but you're definitely reusing the same channel, just like you would if you would have a multi-channel architecture and you have three APs inside along the wall that are using that, that same channel, right? So there's that effect. That doesn't go away whether you're in single channel or multi-channel. The, the problem exists on both sides, right? Except here you're intentionally overlaying a one and a one, right? In <laughs> multi-channel, you, you're oh, they're not really to mitigate that by using multiple channels. Right, they're not really overlaying in the sense that I only have, so you're talking about this AP and this AP on channel one? No, no, that channel one. That, this is that, a room, right? So, so you have a physical separation between this and, and pretend, potentially this. This is a high density auditorium or conference hall or whatever. You know, so you do have that same separation that you would do in MCA. If not, then you adjust you know, for that. You might decide to not use channel one, right? Okay. How do you deal with, so AP with three antennas, you're gonna have two on, two on five gig. How do you deal with- Great question. Great question. You could actually do it the way you want. 100% of Maru APs are software configurable, all of them, right? So you could run them, two radio on 2.4, one on 5 gig, two on 5 gig, <coughs> one on 2. Yeah, I mean, you, you do whatever you want. Now, you all, always, you guys are RF specialists, so you understand that there's always best practice to follow, and the proximity of two radio being, you know, too close to each other. If the channel separation is not big enough, you, you might not get all the throughput you wanted, but you can still run those radio in uh, two, two radio in the 2.4, two radio in the 5 gig. That works. 
Another use case that is very interesting, let's, let's go back to a hospital because I, I like that. So that hospital here, um, we're going to first start deploying our single channel architecture throughout the hospital. So we have what we said, a patient care SSID that is on channel one throughout the whole hospital. That's mission critical, I don't want a patient to die. And so that's why on AP433, I'm, I'm specifying the channel and the radio because don't forget there's three radio in those APs. Then I might want to add a spectrum manager to protect and have a policy. If I'm the IT and men and I can enforce a policy in the hospital and say, I don't want to see any device automation device, heat sensors, or any control of uh, mechanical room, I can say now, no one is allowed to use channel one in that hospital. You can use channel six and channel 11, no problem, but you need to come and see IT or biomed if you ever want to put something on channel one. So now, you, how do you enforce that policy? Use Spectrum Manager. Spectrum Manager is available in two different ways built in into most of our AP, so you can actually have software directly into the AP that is a spectrum analyzer, or you add some external sensor, which is probably better than having it in the AP approach in the sense that you're now down to where the user interference exists and not up where the AP is. And then you have that monitoring uh, of your spectrum that is possible. Another point on that uh, network that I thought I, I would bring that you might not realize, but if you have RFID, which in a lot of use case these days, the battery life of these devices are increased tremendously by single channel architecture. They don't need to chirp on any other channel than the channel one that they're on. They don't need to chirp on channel six and 11. So it's one third of the amount of transmission that they need to do. So battery life, if you have 3,000 of these tags in a hospital, I can tell you that they appreciate that the life will be five years instead of maybe two or three years, right? Now, you have your second SSID, best effort type of service, the onboarding of tablet and et cetera on radio two, channel 36. And at the end, you do multi-channel architecture. So two channels for a single channel, and now I have my third radio configured in a multi-channel environment. Why do I do that? Well, my use case in the hospital is bedside terminal. We have a lot of hospitals that are using bedside terminal to stream HD video MPEG-2 at 25 megabits per second. And this is actually live entertainment that they can watch at the bedside. And they don't run coax anymore. They do it through wireless. And they use the third radio. So obviously, if I'm going to stream out of a single radio 125 megabits sustained to those clients, five of them per radio, I need to be able to have enough spectrum adjacent to that. So my bandwidth requirement is so high that now I'm going to use a multi-channel architecture. So flexibility, single channel for what is critical, and I can use multi-channel if the requirement is. So you have a perfect example of the flexibility of the architecture that in the same network, using the same product, using the same controller on the same AP, you have two different type of architecture working together. Question? Are all three radios all Three by three by threes? Well, depending on the product, uh, we, we have different model. Um, the, these AP433, they're three by threes. 